Hello everyone. We would like to start our st uh, talk on cloud storage encryption with CryptoMeta now. Um, I'm here with Sebastian Stenzel. And my name is Tobias Hagemann. We are both uh, currently studying Master of Computer Science at this university, so we are very pleased to talk about our project at this year's FrostCon. So before we get started, uh, I would like to ask you a couple of questions um, before, yeah, before we talk about the details of CryptoMeta. So you know that, um, yeah, why cloud storage encryption is so important for you. So the first one is easy. Do you use any cloud storage service? Just to name a few, Dropbox, Google Drive, OneDrive, or maybe OwnCloud. Okay, so most of you are using cloud storage services. And it's great. So I personally use Dropbox and Google Drive. Speaking of Dropbox, it has been around for seven years now. So we're all familiar with cloud storage. So I don't have to explain that anymore. Um, so we use it either personally or even business-wise because it's very convenient. We have more and more devices. We have a smartphone, a laptop, or at home we have a desktop computer or a tablet. So we would like to access all our files um, without synchronizing them manually between all those devices because it would be totally annoying. So we use cloud storage service in our everyday life. But now here's another question. <laughs> um, do you trust this cloud storage service you're using right now regarding security and privacy? Maybe you already have a strong opinion this one. Maybe you trust them. Maybe you don't. Or maybe you're indecisive because you say it depends on the files I would like to upload. So let me ask you some other questions or simpler ones. Would you upload naked pictures of yourself to the cloud? Yes, I'm shaking their heads. No, probably not the best idea. And would you upload maybe personal and, yeah, or documents with personal, personal and sensitive information of yourself to the cloud? Maybe a scan of your identity card. Maybe, maybe not. So where do we even draw the line here, what to upload to the cloud and what not? So wouldn't it be great if you wouldn't even have to ask ourselves, what files should we upload there? So the, th the key thing is here that we aren't in control of our data if we upload our data to a cloud storage. Before that, everything was fine on our local hard drive, but now we put the files in the cloud in some cl uh, server farm, and we just don't have control anymore. We pretend to be in control because we are logging into a password-protected account, but in reality, we aren't. So, for example, Dropbox is even obligated by law that uh, they give out their da uh, your data uh, if uh, law enforcement requests it. So, so what just happened here? We use cloud storage service. It's very convenient, but now I've got this <laughs> all these troubles that we don't know what to upload and what not, and it suddenly became inconvenient. <laughs> so, yeah, wouldn't it be great if uh, we just get control of our data? So another title of our talk could have easily been how do I gain control of my privacy in any cloud storage service? So that we still can use Dropbox, but that we can trust our data to be secure. Um, so maybe you can also say, okay, we just talked about trust and control, and um, if we aren't in... Uh, so maybe some of you may say, I can trust them and not be in control. So for example, yeah, I mean, I'm a good citizen. I'm have, I have nothing to hide. So what's even the deal? So I would like to quote Edward Snowden for this one. And he said, arguing that you don't care about the right to privacy because you have nothing to hide is no different than saying you don't care about free speech because you have nothing to say. So I think this is a powerful quote because... With free speech, we can all relate, and it's a beautiful comparison. But I'll stop here. I don't want to get too political here. And so let's look at a scenario. Okay. Say hello to Alice. She wants to saw, store some files in the cloud. So she has heard that um, the cloud could be potentially dangerous. Maybe she read some worrisome news articles about celebrity photos getting hacked, or maybe she just watched a Hollywood movie where they tend to put a bad light on the cloud. 
So she also read that encryption might solve the problem. So Alice is looking for a tool which uses encryption to protect her privacy so that she gains control of her privacy again. And she needs a tool that is trustworthy. It should obviously work well with cloud synchronization. And it should be easy to use. So the last point is very important for us because if it's not easy to use, Alice wouldn't even bother trying it out. So you have to always uh, look for the typical user and not yeah, maybe just us geeks and here in the room. So it should be easy to use. So she found Cryptometer, and this is what Cryptometer does. It's optimized for cloud synchronization, obviously. And it's doing that by encrypting each document for itself, so individually. And the thing is, Cryptometer does only the encryption part, and so it is provider independent. So we can use any cloud storage service we want, and we leave the cloud synchronization untouched. Cryptometer is obviously open source, otherwise I wouldn't uh, talk here at the FrostCon, and uh, Sebastian will talk about it later, why open source is so important. And we always had in mind to keep it simple, so it should be easy to use, so Cryptometer does what it does best and nothing else. Okay, so Alice wants to store two files in the cloud, and she uses Cryptometer like a middleman in between, and the files that are stored, oh, the colors are great. The <laughs> files that are stored uh, through Cryptometer land in a password protected vault. So, what happens in the vault? The files get encrypted. Um, not only the file contents are encrypted, also the file names are encrypted, and they land in a folder D, which stands for data. There are also other types of files, for example, a directory. And we also have some metadata files that are prefixed with M uh, because sometimes they have just long file names and to be compatible with the file system, we have to map it to an ID. But this is something that a user doesn't even have to worry about. It all happens up automatically. So what does Cryptometer obfuscate? So obviously file contents, which is the most important one. Also file names file size to some extent, because we don't want to fill up your cloud storage sp space with garbage data, but to some extent file size and director hierarchy. So to put this in perspective, um, most of encryption tools we've seen only do or obfuscate file contents. And it's not even that common to obfuscate file names, which we find very surprising. And these other tools, just the icing on the cake. So, this is how Cryptometer works, and just to remind you, it's not, the, it's not a big container, it's not a vault that has to be synchronized as a whole to the cloud, it's these individual files inside that are synchronized, so if you edit just one file inside or add a new file, it's only this that has to be synchronized with the cloud. Okay, so now uh, Sebastian will talk about more up here, why open source is important, and uh, tell you some more insight about security. Okay. Oops. Oh, the explodes. <laughs> and the clip. Okay. Let's take this side. So, okay, why open source? And I do realize this is kind of a dumb question to ask in an open source conference, but there are some pretty um, important reasons why we chose Cryptometer to be an open source project, uh, especially when, well, it's a security project, so um, there are some advantages. Uh, first, let's talk about the obvious advantages. So anybody on the world can go ahead and, and if he finds a bug, he can report it on our GitHub uh, repository. Um, especially when there are security weaknesses. Those kinds of bugs are very important to us. And um, if someone wants to add features to the project, he just can fork it and, and add something. So um, those are the 
uh, obvious advantages we know from, from kind of every open source project around. But there's more. So especially when we are talking about trust. So I think many of you heard about the latest revelations about AT&T and the NSA lately. Um, and what I want you to ask yourself is, what happens if only a single person in a huge company um, is corrupt? So his uh, or the, the employees in these companies, they don't even know what others, what their colleagues are uh, working currently on. So um, only a single person might be enough uh, to implement a backdoor in some project. And, well, talking about AT&T, uh, those um, backdoors, uh, don't, they don't get, get uh, discovered for years. And this is something that cannot happen in an open source community project because we have the very opposite, uh, opposite case here. If only one single person is not corrupt and all the others are, he might blow the whistle on the whole project and, well, the NSA wouldn't even have a chance of uh, implementing or, or forcing somebody to add backdoors to some project. So this uh, concept of shared code ownership, this is very important when we are talking about security projects here. So this is about trust, but there's even more. Um, but first, there's another question. Uh, many people ask us, isn't an open source project less secure than a closed source one? And before I answer this, let's look at some typical uh, marketing web pages of uh, different security products. So here's the first one. Um, we, let, we see a lot of buy buttons. Obviously, they want to make money with it. Um, and they are talking about military strength encryption algorithms. Okay, pretty cool, right? We don't really know what, what this means, but sounds convincing. So let's take a different page. Oh, again, military grade security. Seems to be some kind of industry standard, right? And what's else on this side? Uh, something about 256-bit uh, AES, whatever this is. And SSL, yeah, I kind of heard this is important. And, oh, this is trusted by the military and the government. This needs to be quality, right? Well, our German uh, government, they are still using Windows XP, so I don't really know. Uh, sorry, but, yeah. yeah. Um, let's take a, a third example. Um, this one is designed for reli reliable security. And again, they have military strength data encryption. So, well, pretty cool. So I'm here today to tell you a secret. There is no, no such thing as military-grade security. It's just a made-up uh, marketing term. And if you Google for it, you won't even be able to, try, uh, to, to find a definition for it. So um, what did we learn so far? They are all military-grade secure, but they didn't really say anything about how the encryption really works. And does this make the software more secure? One might think, think so, but um, there is sadly this principle called Kirchhoff's principle, um, which basically says that the security of a, of a system must not rely on the uh, implementation of the, of the algorithm being kept secure or kept private, but only on the key. And so this means that there is no gain in security by not publishing the uh, encryption algorithms. So there must be some different reasons, reasons why the uh, marketing uh, web pages don't tell us anything about the encryption. And maybe it's just because of their commercial interests. Of course, they want to sell their product, so they keep it private. And, well, no, this isn't really the reason. Because the encryption is only a, a small part of the project. There's a lot more effort that uh, went into the uh, user experience and the workflow logic, etc. So maybe there's a different reason. Maybe those products have just bad quality. Maybe they don't want people to find vulnerabilities. And this is something where we um, ask ourselves, is, is this the way we want to go? And we said, no. We do want people to find vulnerabilities. At least while we're still in beta, of course. So that's why we uh, went ahead and, well, we published our encryption scheme on our website. We have obviously our source code on GitHub. People started cloning it, so these are uh, the clones in the last uh, 14 days. And we uh, went to crypto communities and asked for help, and we got tons of feedback. So by on this uh, Reddit um, uh, page and by, by email from different persons who really, they found vulnerabilities and they reported them. Here's another one. And 
well, we fixed them, and today, here we are. So, how does Cryptometer work? Um, if we look at it from a high perspective, um, there are um, four components, five if you count the user interface, but let's concentrate on the, on the core. So, there's some WebDAV interface, which is the front end the user inter uh, has to interact with, uh, which provides the virtual hard drive um, one can drag and drop files onto. And, of course, there, there's something uh, cryptographic in the middle and a storage device where all the encrypted files are written to and something called key derivation. More on this in a second. So let's look at WebDAV first. WebDAV is a protocol uh, based on HTTP. Um, it's very um, mature. It's used by all major op uh, operating systems, supported natively, and it allows us, as I said, to, um, to mount this virtual hard drive. And as it's supported by all these major operating systems, we're able to write just one uh, application which, which runs on all those um, systems. And, well, this is, as I said, very mature, well-tested, and has some different, uh, some, some other um, advantages. One of them is that as HTTP has this request-response model and all the encryption that happens on the fly, there are no leftovers on, on your computer, even if you're in some internet cafe, for example, if the application crashed. Because this virtual hard drive is just, yeah, not, not more than just a virtual hard drive. All those files are encrypted and decrypted on the fly. And, well, now about our crypto scheme. We have a patented military-grade secure algorithm. Just kidding. Um, well, we have... As Tobias said before, we have file name encryption. For that, we use some, something called synthetic initialization vector mode of operation for AES, which is a, a deterministic mode. So even if you open a file multiple times and encrypt it uh, a lot of times, the file name will always be the same. So there won't be 20 different copies in your Dropbox uh, folder. And the file content, um, well, before we encrypt them, um, we, we slice your file in chunks. Each chunk uh, is up to 32 kilobytes in size and gets encrypted using counter mode, which is not, um, well, it's, it's a cool mode, but um, it needs additionally something called HMAC to provide some integrity protection. Um, so we calculate additionally to the encryption and, well, this HMAC. Um, yeah, and so we prevent things like uh, shows and cipher text attacks. And... Um, Chunks cannot be reordered in some different position, etc. So those chunks are then merged together, and there we have your encrypted file, which is then written to the storage device, obviously. And yeah, as I said, or as Toby said before, um, synchronization is not our business. So once we have written the file on your hard disk, uh, your native synchronization client of Dropbox to Google Drive, whatever, will uh, see this change and start synchronizing. So let's talk about key derivation. We have something, uh, we have encryption in our system, so we need keys. Where do we get these keys from? Um, well, when you as a user, you type in your password, which is like a 10-character password, for example, and, but what we need is 256-bit uh, keys. And this process of uh, deriving a, a, this long key from a quite short password, this is called key derivation. And there, there are different functions for this. So uh, in former versions of Cryptometer, we use pbkdf2 which is pretty good, um, but one of the community um, well contributions was that we are now um, using script, which is even better um, regarding, well, the uh, brute force protection. So, um, what does this mean? Um, if, if we derive these keys, this function we use for this is very hard to calculate, and this is uh, meant to be uh, hard to calculate. So it takes a lot of time. We're talking about milliseconds here. And this is pretty okay when you're entering your, your correct password. You can wait a millisecond, I think. But when we try to brute force uh, all the different combinations of passwords we have, um, this will take a while. And we're talking about a few thousand years here. So nobody can wait this, this long when he tries to brute force this. So what can the NSA do about it? Um, they can, of course, buy a lot of hardware and run this brute forcing process in parallel. And this is, these are numbers from Colin Percival. He published in his paper about script um, of how much this hardware would be worth uh, if 
one, one uh, would try to uh, crack the passwords in one year. And as you can see, script is uh, a little bit better than pbkdf2. pbkdf2 is still okay, as I said. And yeah, so we need a lot of hardware. And I'm not talking about PCs. I'm not even talking about some high performance clusters here. I'm talking about specialized hardware, which can only do calculations uh, used for these key der derivations. Like, uh, for example, pkdf2, we use a uh, 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 secure hash algorithm too. Um, and uh, the fastest av uh, device available today uh, calculates about 5.5 uh, trillion hashes per second, which is a lot, but it also burns a lot of energy. So um, this device uses more than three kilowatt. And now if you, if you do the calculation, uh, if you buy a lot of these machines, they cost about $2,000, uh, $2, um, and if you buy a lot of them, you also need a lot of energy. So I've made the calculation somewhere here. Um, yeah. So you, to, to run all these machines, you need 80 terawatt. Just to give you a comparison, the largest power station on Earth produces 22 gigawatt. So, okay, this might be a problem to crack. Um, so what if we bypass the key derivation and directly guess the 256-bit key? Well, not the best idea. Um, this is a huge number, and no, this is not the number of possible 256-bit keys. This is about one sextillion, uh, which is the approximate amount of sand grains on Earth. So let's zoom out a bit. And this is the number of possible 256-bit keys. Just to give you a better understanding, if we add three more digits to the end, this is 10 to the power of 80. We have the approximate amount of atoms in our universe. So, okay, we are talking about a system which is practically not really crackable. But maybe there are different approaches, and sadly, yes, there are. So let's talk about the biggest weakness, which is the human factor on our system. Um, this, this neat web comic from XKCD, um, he pretty much put it in a nutshell what social engineering means. So we can either, on the, one, on the left hand side, we can either uh, build this multi-million dollar machine and uh, a few thousand power stations and all this stuff, um, but it will cost us a lot of money and there is a cheaper way. We can also buy like a baseball bat, for example, and try to beat the password out of the person knowing it. Way cheaper. But even without violence, there are still ways to perform this social engineering attack. So take phishing, for example. You all know phishing. You all, I think, have gotten uh, emails from some, some fake customer service uh, tricking you to click on a link where you have to provide a password or, or your cr account credentials. And, well, yesterday this may have worked, um, but today, really, who would fall for this? But luckily, luckily for the hackers, uh, all the um, accounts and security systems got more complex. And today, your account not only uh, consists of your username and your password, but also um, we have like a ton of password recovery settings. And well, a phisher can maybe aim for this, right? So today, a phishing mail might look like uh, this. Dear customer, please remember, do not ever enter your password anywhere, but you have to uh, reconfirm your password recovery settings, so please go on here. Pretty convincing, right? He, he even warns us about not entering our password everywhere, so th this is trustworthy. And yeah, sadly, there are people still falling for this trick. So, what do we learn from, from this? Well, complexity uh, adds further attack points for, for social engineering. So we want to um, avoid <coughs> complexity. And what does it mean for CryptoMata? Um, we talked about vault sharing a lot. In some former versions, we had multi-user support, but yeah, this added complexity and people didn't understand it and, well, uh, a huge mess. So how can we share a secret with somebody? Um, we can either use public keys, which is a pretty um, well-known and good thing and technically perfectly secure, but um, it tends to, or users tend to not really understand um, how to deal with this. And, um, well, take this example. If there's a phishing mail and uh, somebody wants Alice to, um, to upload her key on some website and this website promises to uh, strengthen the, the key or something like this, and Alice isn't really aware that her private key is something she, well, <laughs> which should be kept private, 
um, then this might work. Or take this example. When Alice wants to share something with Bob, she needs Bob's uh, public keys. So she goes ahead and asks Bob, hey, give me your public key. And Bob responds, yeah, here we have my, pub my, uh, my public key. But what Bob didn't, didn't uh, say Alice is that Bob isn't really Bob. So as I said, this public key cryptography is a good thing, but it, well, it needs the user to understand what is happening. Um, so while in communication, we do support this. This isn't the best choice for us in Cryptomator, where we want some per-user uh, privacy, and we want to eliminate the human factor um, from this uh, system. So we are just using pre-shared secret, uh, which is um, technically not that, uh, that secure, but if you add the user to the system, um, I think we, we are uh, going with the best choice here. So. Um, I always say, when you share a password with somebody, you are aware that you share a password. Even my grandma understands this. My grandma wouldn't uh, tell somebody on the phone her banking pin just because he says, well, she won a lottery or something, or she, uh, he's a kind of prince from, I don't know. Um, so uh, if I want to share something with my grandma, I, we both just agree on a common password we, we both know about, and uh, there are no additional complex uh, means that, um, well, at uh, attack points. So, yeah, talking about my grandma, my grandma really likes her iPhone. again. Maybe I'll hold it right now. Maybe it's easier. <laughs> okay, so um, we have been working on a desktop application and we started last year, but Sebastian is the main contributor of the desktop application and I joined earlier this year uh, to work on the mobile application because, as I said, cloud storage is very important for all our devices, so we also have to have a mobile application. So, wouldn't it be just maybe easy to take the desktop application and port it to mobile and that's it? Sadly, it's not that easy. So, what's so diff different about a desktop computer and a mobile device? So, maybe it's size? Well, no, it's um, the resources are fundamentally different. So, take for example the internet connection. So, on a desktop computer, we usually have a dedicated line. We have unlimited tra traffic through a flat rate. And on the other hand, on a mobile device, we, if we are not in a Wi-Fi, then we have the cellular network, and it's slow. Probably here in this building, I don't even have a signal. And uh, we have limited traffic, just a couple of hundred megabytes per month, or maybe uh, a couple of gigabytes per month, if you have a good um, have a good plan. So, yeah, the internet connection is a, is a problem for cloud storage. And another one is, of course, storage space. So, we don't just have, don't have these hundreds and thousands of gigabytes hard drives on our mobile phone. At least, yeah, it's slowly catching up, but uh, still, we can't just synchronize uh, our cloud with 50 gig gigabytes of data to our smartphone. Another thing that's different is... Um, the operating system. So let's take the desktop computer, for example. We are working with files and folders. We drag and drop them. We manage them. And we are working on something called the file system. Hence the name desktop computer. We are working with our virtual desktop. So on our mobile device, we don't really have a file system. So it's a high level of abstraction. We have apps on our home screen. Well. Technically speaking, of course, there is a file system, but it's not uh, comparable to the desktop ones. We just don't have a central file system. So let's take, for example, the Dropbox app on, uh, on a mobile device. Isn't that a file system? Not really. So dro the Dropbox app is imitating a file system, so you can 
move your files around and create new folders and upload something and download something. But it's all, all, uh, uh, everything happening in the cloud, so remotely. It's not happening on a device. It's not getting all the, the complete data. So what has to be done here with CryptoMeta? Because CryptoMeta works on the file system. So we basically have to do the same as the Dropbox app. We have to implement our own basic file system functionality. And um, we have to um, build the user interface and design a workflow completely from scratch because it's, there's no standardized way to do that. And keep in mind, we have this everything on a desktop computer for free by the operating system. So we have to implement that. And another thing is we are dependent on the provider. So we have to know which cloud storage service we are working with because we have to call their APIs. So we have to integrate each cloud storage service one by one. And yeah, this is one of the benefits that's lost, but it can be done with the major ones. So where are we now today with CryptoMeta? Um, currently, it's in beta. So we would like to talk now about what's next on our list. So maybe you can help us uh, out in some of the points. So let's look at the desktop application first. Um, the crypto code is mostly done. So uh, we just released the final release candidate of our crypto components. So the core is done, but we have to improve the integration with each OS. So with Mac, Windows, Linux, and talking about Windows, well, we sure had a lot of problems with it in the past, so uh, we need still more improvement on that. But we would also like to improve uh, CryptoMeta on Linux. For example, we would like to have more native builds for various Linux distributions. We just have a Debian build online right now, so we, it would be great if you would contribute, contribute to that. And of course, on GitHub, you can post an issue. It might be a bug, a feature request, or even a vulnerability. And also, pull requests are very welcome. Uh, on the mobile application, so we're currently working on an iOS app right now. So also there, we would like to improve the integration with the operating system. In this case, with something, something called App Extensions that has been introduced last year. And uh, just to make CryptoMate for us more seamless with the system and more integrated. So it doesn't have to switch back and forth between the apps. And of course, you would like to support more cloud storage services. Currently, we are supporting Dropbox, Google Drive, OneDrive, and iCloud Drive. And we would also like to, for example, uh, include WebDev for, uh, for example, for own cloud. But this is just something we are working on currently. And of course, it has to be easy to use. So also, first-time users instantly know how to use CryptoMeta. So we are refining the user interface and the user experience. But there's probably now an elephant in the room. How about Android? So <laughs> we just don't have the manpower yet. But if you are an Android developer and CryptoMeta sparked your interest, it would be great to have an Android app. Because the crypto code is already written in Java. So you don't even have to start at square one. So now it's time for a little demonstration of CryptoMesa first in the desktop application. Um, okay, where should I put the mic? Uh, let's try here. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, I just uh, recently got these cool new songs by... Um, by uh, Paul and the Atlas, really great band, you know them? Yeah, great, yeah, I know Paul, it's great. <laughs> so, um, if you're interested, I could just open our chat vault and uh, add those files to it. Okay, great. So, if, as you can see here, this is our CryptoMeta uh, desktop application, and here's the list of our vaults. Uh, so, let's take this one, which is the shared one of us both. So, uh, I like frogs, uh, pro tip, by the way. Do not ever enter your password this way when you're on public, but okay. <laughs> so, uh, if I unlock the vault, um, I can now close the window and yeah, here's... Oh, what oh, the oh, fuck? Oh. Don't look inside. <laughs> no, 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 the public <laughs> knows, uh, deserves to, uh, to know what's in there. Oh, oh yeah, Toby, Toby, Toby. 
Uh, okay, let's better get on with our, with our presentation. So, as I said, here are, I have some unpublished songs and, well, they must better not leak yet. Um, so I put them into this virtual hard drive. And as you can see, that's all. Now they are encrypted. So, yeah. Anything you want to see? <laughs> uh, okay, so maybe I'm not that convinced yet. So let's look in Dropbox how it looked like. Okay, so I open my Dropbox. Uh, folder. Here it is. You can already see there are a lot of uh, kind of, uh, well, uh, funny file names in here. So, uh, where do we have this? Ah, yeah, here. No, uh, top secret. This is our vault. So I look inside it, and as you can see, there are a lot of different files. Um, yeah, and if I open these, um, they would just contain some gibberish. So, um, well, yeah, these are our encrypted files. So anyway, what about mobile? Okay, so let's look at the mobile application in its current state. So we will use QuickTime just to have you uh, have my phone on the screen. Okay, great. So as you can see, we have all the vaults we just had. And um, top secret is the one we just used together. And another thing that we can now do is instead of um, writing the password in, we can use Touch ID to log into our vault. And now it's using the Dropbox SDK to load the data. So of course I can browse here through it. Everything looks normal. I can download a file and look at them and operate it, operate on them. So. Um, all the basic file system functionality yeah, had to be written. So for example, if I would like to create a folder, I can do that or upload a file. And basic file operations on each file, I can do by swiping, for example, rename it, move it to another folder, and also delete it. Yeah, you just talk about um, third party app integrations, what about this? Okay, so um, for example, let's go to the camera app. Oh yeah, let's take a selfie. Okay. So, we just took a photo, and we don't want to. Oh, sorry. We don't want to uh, leave the app. We want to stay inside. So, on the bottom left, there's a share button, and on the bottom, there are all app extensions. So, I can use Cryptometer, and this opens a new Cryptometer window without switching to the app itself. So we are still in the camera app. The default settings are fine. I just press, press save. I still have to unlock my vault. It gets encrypted, uploaded. I'm so happy that the Wi-Fi connection is working. And um, now uh, it's in our shared vault. So we can now switch to the desktop application and see if it really landed there. So oh, yeah, yeah, it already is. OK, great. So this seems to work. <laughs> Pretty easy. Okay, then. So, you can get Cryptometer now for free on cryptometer.org. It's currently in beta, but we would, also, uh, we would like to have more testers. Also, the iOS beta you can sign up for, which is uh, distributed through TestFlight. And uh, Cryptometer is hosted on GitHub, you can get it there. And we would like to see any kind of contribution that would be great. So thank you for attending and happy crypting. Okay, I guess we have still time for uh, questions. Okay. Yep. <laughs> Exactly. Okay, so the question was um, about the crypto component, how many people have looked over them and how about auditing? So, yeah, maybe I this. yeah as you said, uh, the, the biggest mistake would be to just assume that our code works, so we really uh, rely on other, on, on different people uh, to review our code. And um, I, I really can't tell you a number uh, right now, but um, it has been around like 
30, 40 different people. Um, and well, it's not only um, anonymous community people from I don't know where, but um, also uh, this, the whole concept has been reviewed by uh, yeah, some professor from this very university. Uh, I don't know if you know Professor Lemke Rust. Uh, in the very beginning of this uh, project, I I've, uh, went to her and then uh, later on, uh, one of the emails you saw there was by, um, what's his name? Uh, I don't know, I just know him by Christoph, uh, who is from, uh, <laughs> who uh, is from the uh, Ruhr Uni Bochum. Um, and uh, he really helped us a lot with it. And yeah, as you have seen, there have been tons of comments um, on the crypto subreddit. Um, but as I said, I don't really know the exact number of people. Yes, please. No, uh, you cannot share. Also, uh, I want to repeat the question. What about sharing files from within a vault with uh, other people? So you cannot share a single file which is inside a vault, but uh, obviously you can uh, create as many vaults as you want and um, create a shared vault where, um, well, where the password is known to all people uh, who work with it. Uh, okay, the question, the question was, uh, can it be used as an encrypted backup tool? Um, this was the really, mot the, the motivation why I started the project. Um, well, back in, I think, uh, yeah, almost two years ago, uh, there was, uh, well, all, all the cloud uh, providers, they had more and more gigabytes of free uh, quota. And this was, this was when I um, myself said, well, Okay, I have my backup drive at home, but if the if my home home burns down, this won't help me anymore. So, the cloud is pretty good when we're talking about um, availability of data, but not good when it comes to privacy. So, this is the motivation why I started this, and uh, I wanted to uh, back up my uh, my important documents that, that need the cloud availability, but my home disk privacy. So. Okay, uh, you please. Okay. Uh, the question was um, if the master key only depends on the password and one would change the password, thus the master key would have been changed. So everything needs to be re-encrypted. No, this is not the case. Uh, what you have seen there was just a key encrypting key. And um, this is used for further keys, uh, especially each file has his, uh, its, its very own key. So um, this is especially important as we are using uh, counter mode where the combination of key and initialization vector needs to be unique. So um, yeah, we have a lot of different keys, but there is this key encrypting key which is derived from the passwords and if you change this only one only your your master key file which is a json file in, inside of the vault uh, will need to be re-uploaded Uh, the question was, is there a command line application? Uh, no, there isn't. Um, and you're not the first one uh, asking this. Uh, there's already a GitHub issue uh, of some uh, people who, who want ex exactly this. Uh, and um, currently, we just have this uh, user interface uh, thing, but uh, it's kind of modular, and I think it wouldn't be too much of a problem to uh, create one. Thank you. 
Yeah, so the question was, uh, if we're encrypting the file names, we will only see encrypted file names and the, the Dropbox pop up, which notifies us about changes. And so we cannot really, uh, we as, as users cannot really um, say what really changed if somebody um, uploaded or uh, edited the file. And yeah, this is obviously something we have to live with. And uh, it might be an option in, in, in further releases to um, make it a user choice if file names should be encrypted or not. Um, but currently, yeah, this is the situation just as you described it. So the question or more as the suggestion was uh, on the mobile application, uh, so we are all using uh, APIs for Dropbox and so, and so on, so everything is stored remotely. And uh, it was asked if we could access our files sometimes offline because maybe sometimes we don't have an internet connection and we would like to access them either less. So this is a feature that's currently missing. That's true. Um, I guess this is now a feature request, so <laughs> it's a great suggestion. Maybe something like a favorites bar, I've seen that in Dropbox app, so you can have them offline accessible, but it's just uh, not in the beta right now, so thanks for the suggestion. Okay. Uh, yeah, the question was uh, if there's a search capability inside the well, encrypted files or, or, or well, the, the plain text view of the encrypted files. And uh, no, we don't. Um, we don't create some kind of index or something. Um, there are. I, I don't know. And to what extent? Uh, what operating systems are able to search on a web dev drive? If they are, there will be native search capabilities by the operating system. But as we just concentrate on the cryptographic part, uh, we, we don't interfere with either the side left from the WebDAV uh, interface and right from the synchronization. So um, maybe if there is um, well a, a problem uh, searching encrypted files, um, there might be some um, well some tweaks we can do to. Uh, make the operating system support uh, the native search capabilities, but well, we have to investigate uh, operating system per operating system for, each, for its own. So you, I hope you understand this is kind of difficult, but uh, definitely also a good point for a feature request. Yeah, the question was uh, in, to what extent we can uh, share just or create sub vaults inside a vault where we uh, just um, give access to some certain folders um, to a different user group. And well, no, we do not support this. Um, this is a decision uh, well made because uh, reducing the complexity. So we think uh, if we want to address the whole majority of users, so including my grandma, um, the the best approach is to um, have one vault with one password, which is shared with one group of users. And so if you want to have different groups, uh, you have to create uh, new vaults. And of course, yes, this does have the disadvantage that you may have to copy files in different vaults. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, oh, OpenStack. Um, so, so I think the question was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, if uh, uh, this can be integrated with uh, OpenStack. And, well, to be honest, I, I'm not an OpenStack expert, so, uh, but as, um, if there is some um, storage synchronization mechanism in OpenStack, then uh, this shouldn't be a problem yet. Okay, the question was about uh, file system kind of limitations like uh, length of file names, um, depth of the directory path, or um, char sets, etc. So um, we have something, uh, well, we, we reduce file names if uh, the path is longer than 255 characters to support uh, Windows. <laughs> So, uh, which is as a kind of a sad story because due to encryption, the file name uh, gets blown, um, and also we have the space uh, 32 encoding, which blows file names additionally, and Windows uh, pretty much sucks on long file paths. So, yeah. Uh, anyway, yeah, we are uh, currently reducing file name length, and um, also also the directory structure is um, well, it's restructured to a kind of flat directory structure. Um, and so all the folders, how, no matter how they are nested in the decrypted um, hierarchy, they all are sibling folders. But those sibling folders are then um, created inside, well, um, of up to 1,024 subfolders uh, that are created on the root level of our encrypted data directory. Uh, so we, we are aware that there are a lot of um, problems with especially one operating systems uh, system uh, and we have done a lot of tweaks to to get around this and as you have seen uh, in our demo vault here we have this uh, even this emoji character inside uh, the file name so um, yeah uh, case sensitive and insensitive file uh, uh, file systems will be supported both uh, that's why we are using base 32 encoding and not base 64 would be, would be more efficient and yeah, if there are any further restrictions, um, oh, yeah, you ask about file size, I think. Um, not anymore, not, not really. Um, there is some natural restriction due to uh, the counter mode uh, we are using. Uh, this, where we have an initialization vector used together with the AES, uh, which is, which consists of a nonce and a counterpart, and the counter is up to 64 bit, and it must not repeat. And, so any number, any 64-bit number uh, would be the maximum uh, number of bytes we uh, support per file, but this is kind of, well, you will never reach it. <laughs> At least not today. One more. <laughs> Yes, it's. Okay, the question was about huge files. Uh, if we have, for example, a one gigabyte file inside our vault and we change just two bytes of it, uh, then yes, we have to um, re-upload the whole one gigabyte. Um, this is also done because we generate a new random per file key, so the whole file needs to be re-encrypted. And um, we decided, well, to go for security instead of convenience here. And... Um, yeah, I know this is a problem. It, it wastes your your uh, bandwidth and um, is yeah not ideal. But um, if we are talking about the cloud, this might not be an everyday use scenario uh, because well, who stores like his his movie collection in the cloud? I I'm, I don't know if this is the best uh, use case. <laughs> yes, please. 
Can you, can you speak a bit up, please? Oh, it's about file size obfuscation. Um, so the question is, how do we obfuscate file size as each file gets encrypted for its own? One would assume that the encrypted file is always as big as uh, the uh, plain text file. And well, we add some random length padding to the end, uh, which is up to, um, we, we um, want to add up to 10% of the original file size, but we have a lower and an upper bound, so there will be enough randomness. So it isn't um, a 100% obfuscation, but it helps, for example, if, if Hollywood knows that your uh, leaked <laughs> uh, movie is, is exactly 2 gigabytes, 300 megabytes, 250 I don't know, some some certain size, uh, this will be obfuscated so it cannot be identified just by the number of bytes. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, at least uh, four kilobyte overhead and a maximum of six, I, know, is it, I, think, I think 16 megabytes overhead, somewhere between this range. But as I said, uh, small files will not have um, that much of an overhead because we try to keep it up to uh, 10%. So, um, cryptographically, not ideal. Uh, so there's kind of a compromise between um, perfect random numbers and a deterministic approach to, um, well, uh, keep it to some good extent, uh, the, the amount of additional bytes. Other more questions? Okay, I think, I think this was <laughs> about that. Thank you.